the left we have Ms. Tara Gaddis, senior English major, can you wave Tara? Tyra, sorry. Uh, Mr. David Griffin, also a senior English major, and Ms. Jasmine Pollard, another senior English major, so we expect a robust and thought-provoking conversation from what's about to happen. All right, so I will not uh, belabor the point with much talk. I will fire the first shot, and then we will let the panelists take over. So uh, when I read the book, it was really interesting that you had this running theme about how normal your mother was able to create a home life for you. And I just couldn't understand how she was able to do that because it was such an abnormal situation. The ideology of your father espoused, a philosopher, an intellectual, a spiritual leader, a revolutionary, I mean all these things. How was she able to do that? How was my mother able, can I just, can everybody hear me? Yes. How was she able to create that sense of normalcy? Um, you know, she just did. She was really very amazing. Um, very amazing. And she, you know, I, I was looking at a video of her recently, and she said that before she met her husband, she was like the rest of us. She didn't know much about herself. She didn't have a whole lot of respect because she didn't know anything about her history. and. And so after having this wonderful relationship with her husband, that she learned more about the richness of her heritage and her identity. And so she raised six girls um, with art that reflected who we were as women. We had you know, statues. We had arts in our house that, was, that reinforced um, pride in our uh, heritage, um, and she just really, I mean, she, she just did so much for us. You know, she made sure we had quality education that she had to pay for. Um, you know, her home was firebombed, so, her, you know, her, her means was meager, but she made it work. You know, she ended up getting us a home that Congresswoman Bella Abzug was part of the Civil Rights Movement, and she understood my father and mother and you know they just all came together and we got this home but my, my mother had to continue to pay our education and all these other things i think that she had the insight from you know as as i understood from her husband you know the importance of history and i can't emphasize that enough i think when you understand the importance you know of history you know you better appreciate who you are and you see yourself in mainstream society in spite of all of the negatives that says you are supposed to be one way that is counter to who you are by nature um, that it, it angers you and it helps you to just really um, you know be normal <laughs> awesome thank you um miss paul uh, first of all i just want to thank you so much for writing this and um giving your mother a voice. Um, as a mother myself, um, in this book, I uh, noticed she gave vivid details. It's probably around the same period you were going with your question, uh, how your education was world-rounded. You uh, received the top education and your mother emphasized that contrary to what people may have thought you should have gotten, you know, a, a very revolutionary um, type of uh, education. But she did stress that in the home. Um, how do we, uh, well, how should we view a good education in America um, to expose our children to uh, culture and we may possibly not have those means in Mississippi Delta or in Mississippi, you know, how do we expose our children to this? Well, you know, revolutionary education, you know, what is that? Because my, we, not only do we go to school, my mother had someone come and tell us stories about women who made significant contributions, about people of the diaspora who made significant contributions about Muslims who make significant contributions. 
So my mother took responsibility to make sure that her children were not, she didn't rely on the educational curriculum to teach us. She made sure that she taught us. And if there was something she didn't know, then there was someone who came in and taught us. But um, that was probably, you know, answering your question and probably anybody else's question that my mother took advantage. She took responsibility to make sure that her children understood who they were. So that when we came out into the world and we encountered that black lives don't matter, that we, you know, that we knew that our lives matter. And not only that, but that we would work, uh, that we would work towards justice. You know, we would work toward, we would work to help those who didn't know. You know, I, I mean, I have so many mentees um, who had absolutely, you know, no self-love, no nothing, you know. And, and so when I saw that that was very um, consistent, you know, I started writing books and, you know, working harder. So it really is a thing of, you know, being your brother and sister. I think we should maybe move to Ms. Gowdy. So the question I'd like to ask is more about the religious differences in the book. Um, can you explain some of the, the things that you went through that you described in the book as far as the differences in religion? Differences in religion. Uh, I mean, differences with growing up Muslim compared to friends that were Christian, and you, you guys are different things from this tradition. Um, you know, I mean, my grandmother was Christian, Baptist, you know, I went to Baptist churches whenever I went to Philadelphia. I always wanted to catch the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you know, I would see these people doing what seemed to be backflips, and, you know, I wanted to know, how could I, how can I do that? Um, so I always had a love for my heritage, my african Americanness you know, which was gospel music, the church. Um, and, you know, but I was Muslim. So the difference, I don't know that there is a real big difference, but one of the things I can say is when I went to the Middle East and I made Hajj, what I experienced was peace, complete peace in a religion. And it was complete peace when you prayed. And, and it helped me to see the dysfunction of what happened to us. Mm -hmm. You know, that sometimes we go to church and we hear, we hear our history, we hear, you know, the trauma that happened, as opposed to when I was in, when I was praying, you know, with Muslims and there was no trauma and there was no, it was just complete, consistent peace. And so, you know, I just, saw that that was indicative of what had happened to so. Well, I would like to ask, um, you write in your um, book, you say, if you're light, you are right. If you're brown, stick around. And if you're black, get back. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, what are the implications of color or interracial discrimination, shading discrimination for African Americans? It's really so unfortunate, you know, that sometimes it depends on if we if we don't have if we don't have any knowledge of our history, then we see our blackness in not a, a positive light. And it goes to the importance of this generation addressing that. You know, that that was not my saying if you're black, you black, you brown, you know, but that was that's just something that has stuck with us, you know, throughout slavery and now into this new era. And, and you know, and talking about slavery should not be something that we cringe or, you know, get uncomfortable about talking. It's something that we have to talk about. Right. You know, it's extremely important that we do talk about it. But not that we only talk about slavery, that we talk about free slavery so that we don't feel doomed. You know, and that we take pride in everything that's happened to us because no matter what's happened, we've always come out on top. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's really unfortunate when 
we discriminate against ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the only way that we can come out of that is by learning about history. And so that's why you have my father, you know, making those statements that he made. It was for shock factor. Because it was in the 60s that we had no idea <coughs> what Africa was. All we knew was it was someplace where Tarzan was. You know, we didn't want to be Africans because African people didn't wear shoes, they ate people. You know, it was this whole misconception, but it was what we were taught was the miseducation of black people. And so if we don't take the time to learn about ourselves and our history, we will continue to discriminate against our own selves. You do, you also write, um, we should teach our children their history and not rely on anyone else. But to do that, we have to first know who we are. That's a true statement. And then I just wanted to ask, you know, anybody in the audience, you know, you are, are attending JSU for a higher education. You know, you're here not to receive a refund checks. Did they, did they clear it? Anybody know? But we're not here to receive a refund check. We're here to learn. Um, I consider JSU an educational experience to get higher learning, but also a cultural and ethnic learning because it's I, the majority of our professors are African American, so they can teach us things that I figure that, you know, lack of a better word, a Caucasian teacher at university would not be able to, you know, because they are of my descent. So, um, how important is black history education for African Americans? And that's anybody or? Black history education is extremely important for African Americans. It's important for Afro-Latinos, it's important for Afro-Asians, it's important for our students in general to know. Um, as a graduate of Jackson State, I now reside in Providence, Rhode Island, where I'm an um, instructor of sixth grade science and social studies. It is, my education in Jackson State prepared me to go north and say, no, there's racism still here, and we have to educate our students on how to combat that and how not to be colorblind. Um, colorblindness is a defect. It's not something that enlightens or empowers students. So that's what Jackson State taught me, and that's what I feel I go out into the country and spur out. What we want to do is we do want to remain on task with reviewing the book Grown Up X. So what I'd like to do right now is I'd like to ask each of the panelists to give a <coughs> one two minute reflection of what you gained from the book. What did you glean from the book? Is this most significant meaning or something that stood out to you? And when each three of you have your one or two minutes to reflect, I'd like Ms. Shabal to say if that's really what you were trying to put out there in the book, if that's what you wanted the book, your message in the book to do. Start with ladies first, Ms. Jasmine. If I can ask one more question first, please. Okay. Um, but um, in, in the book, it, it says if you, your mother, and tried to uh, emphasize the importance that uh, the Shabazz family and the King family had, but it's still this myth or that is this long ending. Malcolm against Marvin. So why is it still that debate today? Why do you feel like it's still? Well, I, you know, it's so unfortunate because it is. when it comes to, say, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, you know, we know that these are forefathers that made the significant contribution. And we're never, cho we're never encouraged or forced to choose one over the other. But it seems like when it comes to people of, you know, African Americans and really people in the diaspora, because even when I go, you know, other places, it's, you know, it's also that way. It seems to just be this divide. You know, you're on one side or the other. And instead of accepting, you know, that Malcolm and Martin both made a tremendous sacrifice, but also that my father put a mirror up to America, you know, to our government and said, look, this is what you're doing. And he challenged that. He could not be brought. You know, he, he didn't compromise anything. And so I don't think that, you know, that's not palatable. And even with Dr. King, Dr. King has been redefined, you know? So I just think that um, we shouldn't have to choose one or the other. We, we can accept the fact that there are many 
people, many African Americans or people of the African diaspora who have made significant contributions and sacrifices and that they should be role models and that we have to take, you know, make it out of business our duty to make sure that they're honored in history, that, you know, that we write books, that we do screenplays, that we do whatever it takes to preserve <coughs> our history. A lot of people don't know, and you mentioned it in your book, and I, I feel like I say this all the time, but um, <laughs> they became the same people at the end, you know? Well, Martin became, he, he realized, you know, what was going on, and he became, I guess, a little more, I guess he saw the nonviolence thing, wasn't really working to his advantage, and then your father, I guess it would say, I, <laughs> others would say he, kind of calm his militant down a little bit. Right. And it's really not so much. You know, when, the, when we learned of Malcolm X, he was only in his 20s. Right. So by the time, you know, they said he changed, he continued to evolve. Right. It's not that he changed, because he was always compassionate. He was always loving. He was always responsible. You know, right. So, what did you say? Teaching love. Oh, exactly. So. But um, to be a week, I'm going to give me give some reflections. Um, coming from a large household of women, I just wanted to commend your mother for raising all those women because it, it, it is it is hard uh, dealing with all the estrogen estrogen. Um, so um, it was just so, it was so much because I read the autobiography and like I said, I just wanted to thank you. For giving your mother a voice, you know, because we, we haven't heard her side of the story. And she was able to carry his legacy on in a respectful way and keep you out of harm's way. And um, uh, it was a very good read. I just. I like this, I like the book because it expressed education <laughs> to the full. Like, you and your sister, you said one of your sisters were the smartest sister that you had, or was named the smartest or whatever. And you stressed education to the point to all, you and your family, you all did great things. And you let us know that our history is very important and that education is important, that we need to be in school trying to better ourselves and become something. And because I believe that, like you stated here, if we teach our children our history, you know, um, we should do that. And we need to know who we are first. And I believe that to the core, because I believe if we taught our children and our homes, and besides what school gives, because they're not, they're not going to give everything in high school. They're not going to give the history of our culture. But if we teach our children and our home our history as we know it, I don't believe that We'll be out here trying to fight, trying to figure out when the next Nicki Minaj rap song is coming out, or who's going to be shaking their tail, or who, how can I get high? I believe that if we all came together and taught all of our children in our home, our black history, we'll be trying to still make history. We'll be, we'll be trying to get better and evolve and still try to become one as a people instead of killing ourselves one by one. Because we know our history. So I wouldn't want to harm my fellow brother, even though I don't know him, and never grew up with him. I wouldn't want to harm him because he was African American, you know, because they were together. And I feel as though now we are separate. And this book enlightened me on how to reach out to other people and say, hey, you need to go grab growing up eggs. <laughs> Read it, because you on track. <laughs> you know, I just want to say that my father said, I mean, if we understand slavery as it was, right, it was brutal. Right? I know, I maybe mean, you saw 12 years of slave. Mm -hmm. So it was so brutal. And, and so my father said, only a fool will allow his enemy to teach his children. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So it says that we have to participate in the curriculum of teaching yes. our children. Yes. That education is so important. Whenever I go abroad to, you know, to any other country, everyone is so astute because they understand the value in education. And it's unfortunate that sometimes, you know, we intentionally, you know, we just don't raise them sometimes. 
there are some of us who don't raise the bar. And so the ones about the, those of us who are educated and progressive and, and, and knowledgeable and everything, we have to take it upon ourselves to make sure that we pull the other ones who just are impatient and they don't want to learn much. So this was an amazing memoir, I believe. And what I brought from it mostly is just the, the message of encouragement. Because through everything that you went through and through everything your mother went through and your sisters, through the memoir, you don't even see any sense of like just feeling bad for yourself or anything like that. You everything that you went through, you still, you know, you went on, you got your education. You you didn't seem to to stop and just say, oh, let me feel sorry for myself or anything. You just kept going. And then you took that education and took everything your mother and your father taught you. And now you're out here sharing it with us and, and opening people's eyes as far as what we need to do as a, a black community. And like I said, that's just encouragement to me to, to go out and do something else more than what I'm doing. You know, when you look at history, um, you know, we can take the example because, you know, it's been preserved so well with other people pretending like it's their history. But if you look at the history in, in, in Egypt, right, and we see all of these uh, monuments that were resurrected, they were uh, roughly, roughly cut because of them, you know, the man and woman. Um, it was all of this stuff, and it was in abundance because it was a way of inspiring these people. History was clearly very important to these people, and that's a part of who we are. And so we're supposed to have these uh, lessons, you know, we're supposed to share the stories of our forefathers and our foremothers for inspiration, you know, so that we can hold each other up and see the beauty in ourselves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One more quick thing. Um, I thought it was really funny how you express a lot of people don't know that and you bring up the story, the story in the beginning of you being attending this award show, and you're having a normal conversation with this man. And how did that end? Well, how do people really react to you? You know, being about to make story. Somebody asked me, was I? <laughs> I, I guess because you know, yeah, I'm looking. I was like, no, I wish, but. <laughs> No, but people have this thought of how you would look. You know, how do you, who I would be. yeah, who yeah. you would be, how do you react to that? Well, when I went to, um, you know, and again, it, it says that they don't know who Malcolm is, you know. Mm -hmm. But when I went to college, and I, I know I read that just in my book, um, I had come from a prep school, you know, and my mother dropped me off on campus in a dormitory, and, and when my mother left, there was another dorm called the Dubois, the WB Dubois dorm. So all the power to the people, the move people came to my dorm and they packed all my things up and they brought me to this new dorm. Now I had gone to school with a lot of white people and it wasn't a big deal that I was Malcolm X because most of them had, their parents were someone, you know, so it wasn't like they chased me, you know, on campus. And so, now I went to school with a lot of white people because it was a good school and those were the people who could afford the school. It wasn't because my mother was trying to, you know, make me something. But um, when I went to college, I remember telling a friend of mine that she couldn't come and visit because it was different where I had gone to school. And so they wanted to make me the chairperson of the Black Student Union and, you know, I went to that and I was 16 years old and, you know, I, it's like, just say no to drugs. <laughs> you know, and so I wasn't this person that they expected. And, and it definitely was challenging for me, you know, in my self-discovery. And um, so I remember calling my sister and saying, you know, what am I supposed to do? Who, you know, as Malcolm makes his daughter, because their perception of Malcolm was this, like, you know, I would have one kung fu, you know, I would be geared down, ready to battle. And, you know, if you look at my father, my father was very loving, he was very compassionate, he was an action-oriented, result-oriented person, he was a problem solver, you know, and, and so my mother raised her girls with a lot of love and a lot of 
self-love and love for our people. And we truly believe that we are our brothers and sisters keeper. That's who my mother was and my father was. So, you know, it, it, it was the norm. I think um, now would be an appropriate time to take questions from the audience. In, in a region where like an overbearing uh, pressure of, of white privilege and white power is just very present here in the South, a lot of parents really don't have a certain black consciousness of in of themselves, right? And a lot of children, a lot of students grow up pretty race neutral. It's an uncomfortable thing to talk about, everyone's experience. They really just don't want to go there. So in, in, in this type of environment, how would you, um, how can you sort of form, or what direction do you think you would be, we should be able to form that appreciation, that self-love and respect for our culture when it's when it's uh, it's uncomfortable? It's not anything you want. You don't want to look at it. You don't want to talk about it. So. Well, in the 1960s, um, you know that was after Malcolm there was the say a lot of black and proud movement, and. Um, <coughs> You know, the Power to the People movement, the big Afros, and, and you know, all that, Black Panthers. And so it was students on campus with so many, with such le less than what you all have today. And they said, enough is enough. We demand to have an Africana Studies department. Mm -hmm. And so they rallied and they made sure, they did everything it took until they got an Africana Studies department. <coughs> So this happened all across, the, all across our nation. You guys have so much more. And so you have four, three people who are up here and yourself, that's four. And you've got all these people in, in here who stayed. So that means that they're also eager for something. So it just means that you, you have to just do the work. You, know, you just have to do it. Because for some reason you've gotten very lazy, you know, for, for, for I mean, it was, almost kind of designed for us to be lazy and distracted and everything else. But we've gotten lazy and we really do sit back and we think that somebody else is going to change something for us. And if nobody's going to change anything, and again, it speaks to the importance of history because if you know history, you know that nobody is going to change anything for you, that we have to do it ourselves. So you should work hard and identify some people, let them identify people, and you have to teach your community yourself. I would just like to echo your points regarding education, both in the academic world, but as well and more importantly, in the societal world. And that is that, just like the Holocaust you pointed out, it needs to be remembered and it needs to be passed down because white society is not gonna print the truth about it. And you need, black history needs to be taught by the families to their children, and that needs to bring everybody together so you can be powerful. You got a question. Just, just a question. Mr. Loved his people. She loved her husband. 
So she continued to make sure that his legacy was correct, that he was not written out of history, that he was not given you know, another definition of who he was. Because she knew this definition, you know, this portrayal was not him. I love my mother, I love my father, I love my people. So it's very natural for me to do what I do. I didn't choose to do this, it just sort of happened. Oh, I, should, I take that back. But, but what I mean is I didn't go to college to go and then, you know, become a public speaker and to open up my personal life to others, right? I did it because I found so many people who were bruised, who were in need, and who were open to, you know, to, who were honest to say, I don't know and I, and I need. Um, you started off your talk this morning uh, talking about how Mississippi has such a rich history. And one of the things that, uh, being a person that's new to Mississippi, I've always, I, 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 I also recognize the significant African American history, black history that is within Mississippi. But I think many people, and I'm just going to say this, that are from Mississippi take it for granted and don't recognize and um, emphasize and, and, and highlight the stories that are within this region and the wonderful history that all of these people have within them themselves. Uh, I would like for you, because you are somebody that I think a lot of people will listen to. You are, um, uh, you, you, you have a wonderful history yourself and you have a way of emphasizing. So I would love for you to reiterate the significant history that is here and to encourage all of these young people to look with, around themselves, around in, within their own environment and in their own community, and reach back and, and get, begin to appreciate the history that they're standing right in right now. Right, right. That's extremely important. And, and, and I would imagine that most of the people were born here are descendants of those who just pioneered. And, and so if, if you don't preserve their history, I mean, gosh, you know, that means your life is just in vain. And I think it's so important that we honor those who made these significant, these enormous sacrifices for us. You know, and even if you're not from Mississippi, that you preserve the history. I mean, look at Fannie Lou Hamer. She was beat by a, a sheriff. And, and she said she was beaten so badly that when her dress started to rise above her and she mustered enough strength to, to pull her dress down and the sheriff took a whole dress and pulled it over her head and just continued to beat her. Right. You know? But in spite of that, she continued the work. So it is so important, I can never stress enough how important it is that for our people who made, first of all, who cultivated a barren land, for nothing. So you were already at a disadvantage while others made so much money. But they cultivated a barren land. They gave all of themselves for us. That all, the only thing that we can do is honor. And that's why I write these books. There's no way that I would not do anything. I, can I say something? Um, that's a thing that I, I'd like to stress because Mississippi history is so rich. But I think people don't appreciate it or appreciate it because it's not glamorized. Like those, you know, maybe other places in the north or something like that. Mississippi history is dirty and it's, it's bad and it's, it's just raw. And I just don't think we want to be looked at as that. But that's, that's what it is, you know. So I just feel like it's just not glamorized enough. But we still need to face it and embrace it. Uh, when this is a little funny, but when I go to church conventions and I, we have a big organization, AOH, and when I go to church conventions and they're from the north or what what have you, and I'm from the south, and I say you all should come to uh, um, my church, Anointed Temple, and they say, oh, where is it? You know, and I say, oh, it's in Mississippi. Oh, I ain't going down there. They gonna hang me. They gonna hang me down. There. It's too it's too much racism down there because they still see us as the slave state. They see us as this, and so it's not like she said, it's not 
popular like Georgia, Atlanta, all, it doesn't, they see us as a poor slavery state and they don't want to come in. So I think, it, I think we do need to let people know that it's, it's maybe, you know, you may be considered a slavery state, but this is historical. This is a <coughs> history state. And so for that, you are who you are up north because we are who we are down here in the south. So. I have a question. In your book, you talk about the importance of knowing your history. My question is, what is your response to HBCUs not having a text African-American studies curriculum? Well, again, I think it's the people. You know, it's not the universities, it's the people. And so if we're professors at these schools, or we're students at these schools, then we're not doing our job to make sure that they do. If we know that there are HBCUs that are not, that they don't have a rich history, you know, that, that they don't provide a, a healthy identity to the students, then we should be doing something about that. Yep. Maybe. I have a question. <laughs> I'm going to go to this side because I know some people, okay. the spotlight is blind to me, so anybody over here. I'm right here. You're right, I'm right here. here. <laughs> My question, due to the H, what Jack says at HBCU, um, students are deserving of knowing our African American history, our Afro pre-slavery history. How do we go about petitioning getting an Afro American studies course at an HBCU at Jackson State? What mm -hmm. steps should we take to have that on this campus? Just do it. Just do it. You know what it takes. You don't have to ask me. I live in New York. <laughs> you, get, you get some people in here and you just do it. Just like those students, just like those students got the Africana, I mean, not only did they get Africana studies in Cornell, they got, a, you know, across the nation. So you just do it. 